people as they come in. Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Dawn Monaco and this is our Real Transition Partners um, webinar. Um, just a little bit about Real. So we are jointly managed by Span Parent Advocacy Network, where I am located. Um, the Federation for Children with Special Needs, which is in uh, Massachusetts, include NYC, which is in Manhattan, the Parent Network of Western New York, which is in Buffalo, and Starbridge. We work jointly on this grant. And this grant is um, provides information, training, support youth and young adults with disabilities and their families um, and professionals. So we want our long-term goal is to improve outcomes for youth and young adults with disabilities. So we are recording this and the recording will be sent out to everyone through Eventbrite. <clears throat> and um, we will be having several webinars throughout the year. So keep an eye out for that. Now that you've registered, I will send um, a notice to you with, um, since I have your email now, I'll send a notice to you with uh, the information about our next webinar, which will be most likely sometime uh, in November. <clears throat> um, also, I will be emailing you um, a link along with the recording to some resources um, so that and a copy of the PowerPoint. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And today we have Michael Scanlon with us from the um, Connecticut Parent Advocacy Center, who is presenting. He is your youth coordinator there. We've been working with Michael for many, many years, and we're very happy to have him with us today. So welcome, Michael. Um, he is going to be presenting on mental health and employment. So you can go ahead and share your screen, Michael. All right. Hi, everyone. Just give me one second here to get my screen up. Sure. And while he's doing that, I just want to mention that um, I will be monitoring the chat throughout the webinar. And if you have a question that's related to something he is talking about at that time, um, I will stop um, Michael and uh, give him the question to answer. But we will have some time at the end to do questions and answers. At the end, I will also poll so that you can um, tell us your thoughts and uh, what you, uh, how you feel about today's webinar. And then you can also in the chat box, let us know if there's a topic that you would like us to um, facilitate in the future. I would love to hear about that as well. So I'm gonna to continue to let people come in, Michael, um, but uh, you can go ahead whenever you are ready. Awesome. Well, I just wanna thank everyone. I know, you know, it's lunchtime and um, I'm just so thankful for the participation. So. Um, before I really get started, I just kind of want to say you guys are actually the first ones to see this expanded presentation. This um, and talking with Dawn and like, you know, collaboration opportunities. Um, you know, I had previously done a smaller, more condensed version for a Department of Labor presentation. I'm in Connecticut, so um, I'd love to hear your thoughts if, you know, this has been really helpful for you, as Don said. Um, so I just appreciate any feedback as, you know, I continue to find ways to bring this message out to communities. So in talking about mental health and employment, this is something, and you'll hear more about parts of my story. You're going to hear a little about theory. Um, you know, best practices. So I'm going to throw a lot at you in maybe 30 to 40 minutes. So I apologize. It's going to be a lot for a Thursday at lunchtime, but we're going to have fun. Um, so kind of getting started. Um, I thought it's a really kind of a neat way to think about mental health, kind of like food in a restaurant. And some of you may be like thinking like, what is this guy talking about? But, you know, in bringing that perspective shift for those of you, and, you know, I'm going to make sure I speak to you know, professionals, advocates, young adults, uh, parents. So, um, and Don, like we talked about, if you want me to elaborate on anything up, upon every slide, or if you have a question, Don, we can totally have that back and forth conversation. But in thinking about mental health and employment, um, the reason I open with this is, you know, in certainly my own experiences, I want to talk about first what does not work. And I can, you know, you're going to see here a pretty nasty looking lunch. And um, the way I think about like a, a way that we want to move away from is the school cafeteria approach. And what I mean by that is I think we may have all had that 
um, experience in a cafeteria where, you know, maybe on the worst of days, they're like, oh, what's for lunch? And they're like, it's this. And if you don't like it, you know, that's what it is. And good luck, too bad, right? And that's how, honestly, um, you know, mental health in some ways can be seen by some people, by some systems. Um, so trying to, to paint that visual picture, right, of, of what we want to move away from, you're going to notice there's a lack of choice, um, a, a lack of agency, you know, so um, yeah, we <laughs> pretty much we don't want that. And so kind of moving to a perspective that does work, a phrase I often use is what I call the wellness buffet. And you're going to see there are lots of amazing things. And when I say buffet, I really do mean um, you're going to see choice, you're going to see dignity, what would work best to support you. So thinking about that, and we'll kind of dive deeper into maybe, you know, nuts and bolts on that. But um, you know, I like to kind of paint this picture right up front that, you know, that's how I see mental health. That's that's why I'm so passionate about the work because I've had those cafeteria moments, right? And so talking about now wellness at work, using both of this framework here, you're gonna see, you know, what's not working um, and what I've personally been through, you know, what I've had those water cooler conversations with colleagues, um, you know, if you talk to, to young adults, and really, I mean, we have all may have experienced this at work in maybe a not so positive way, shame, fear, lack of, of support, discrimination, punitive policies, toxic company culture, absenteeism, poor performance, um, and then kind of going to uh, positive mental health when you're in an employment and agency that really supports you, you're going to notice you're almost always it'll be strength based inclusive, have that positive company culture, have an open door policy. And of course, by proxy of having all that, uh, you'll be able to do your best. And I also want to say, I'm huge on normalizing mental health. And, you know, I'm not discounting what anyone has, has gone through. Um, but I think that, um, you know, and part of my story and my message is I can, there's, you know, an under spring understanding of mental health affects everyone. And I, I'm a huge advocate of that. And it doesn't have to be something huge always. I mean, it, it, or, or it could be something huge. And, you know, I always say life happens and you can't do life alone. And uh, mental health could look like you'll see here, these are just hypotheticals where a coworker suddenly learns her child is sick. A boss is going through a tough divorce. A young adult shares they're homeless. A neighbor might have financial difficulties. All of those things um, could be people, you know, in our everyday lives, right? And so, um, the way I approach systems change and how do you support? Um, how do you support really everyone? But I know focusing on young adults is getting to uh, a deeper understanding and that and that perspective shift. And so, kind of continuing with the philosophy up front here. Uh, another couple phrases I'm huge on is support and opportunity equals success. So breaking that down, what I mean by that is, again, both personally in my life and what I've seen out there in, in the field and advocacy and in mental health and services is it's the, it's the rare agency or, um, you know, person in a supportive role that can do both of these at once. Because, um, for example, um, you know, and, and, and for myself, if you just have support without opportunity, could that, you know, that's held me back where it's almost became in some respects um, restrictive to my personal growth, to me, to me gaining my own independence. So whereas if you just have opportunity, it almost can feel like you're setting young people up to fail because if you're like, oh, go do this or sign up for this or try this without that support, um, it may become a self-fulfilling prophecy, and, and, and I'm not saying you, you always need it, and I'm, I'm, you know, there's always exceptions, but, but I say this generally, that success is much greater when you do combine support and opportunity, and I'm happy to, you know, elaborate that on at a later point as well, but I think also the heart of what um, I hope to bring to you all is changing uh, what's wrong with you to what happened and that's very trauma informed but i'm not clinical at all but i really like you know to share that because it it takes away um any labeling any stigma any shame and it really helps you know approaching 
um, just life that way, you know, not even just people, but life is what happened. So I, I, I just want to leave that with you all as, as we continue. And so I have a little case study. Um, and so, you know, some of you may be here, um, you know, as an advocate, as a parent and young adults here. Um, so just in whatever your role you're currently in, imagine this young adult is in front of you. Someone who's had a traumatic brain injury at four years old, broke their jaw, uh, multiple health issues in early childhood, um, relearning fine motor skills, speech therapy. Um, this person went through anxiety, depression, and agoraphobia as a teenager. Um, they grew up with a direct family members living with mental health challenges. Um, and this person through inpatient, through two inpatient hospitalizations as a teenager. And so I share this to kind of have a reflective moment. Uh, a moment of honesty, honestly, is um, would you feel confident or hopeful for this young person? Would you believe they can gain independence? So I'll let you sit with that while I get a sip of water. And I say that because this is me. And so, you know, uh, and again, my whole story, of course, I can't boil that down to a few slides in a quick presentation. But I say that because, um, you know, growing up and, and going through those transition periods, it certainly felt like um, I was just my toughest moments, just the struggles that I went through. And I you know, was so blessed to have a strong support system to help move me forward. But as we all know, there are many young people um, around the world who did not have such support. And so um, I even included, this is actually I, you know, just mind blowing to me, the picture on the bottom left here, those were just my medical records just from my first handful of years. So, and none of it was positive. And so remember when I talked about um, changing, you know, what's wrong with you or what happened. Um, that's really why, because that kind of, in a sense, um, whether you want to call it illnesses, accidents, trauma, that kind of became my identity. And that really helped shape how I saw the world, how I saw life, how I saw others. And so, um, you know, I hope this may bring a perspective shift to some of you, um, but wanted to include that. And then really talking about the impact of supports. These are just, you know, pictures of, you know, from the last handful of years or on my life. And, um, and, I, and I included this because, um, and I got a great response from my last presentation. You guys are getting the full one, right? Um, in that it can be interesting because we don't always know the big picture, right? Um, you know, because and met when I was so little with a lot of my early childhood trauma, I remember hearing stories from my aunt who was one of my most, you know, fiercest advocates, you know, when she was telling me, Michael, like, do you remember like when you were at the one of the hospital visits and I overheard this one doctor say, oh, he'll never gain independence. He'll never do this. He'll never do that. And and so it's it's can be those little like insidious, whether it's comments or things written down. But, you know, it's um, you never know what someone can achieve. And I know, you know, we're all, you know, by you being here today, I have no doubt you're all amazingly supportive, but um, it, it really is interesting as I keep presenting this, as I think back of all I've gone through, all I've achieved and, um, and all that happened. So, and really, you know, the impact of support, and we'll talk a little bit about what you can do to make a difference and some kind of, again, nuts and bolts. And a phrase I really honestly love is the diagnosis is not the destiny. And so I'm just a huge fan of creating change. You know, how can you see others from a lens of hope? How can you support those um, to, to create that change in their life? And so I'll leave you with that. I was going to get it. I was going to put it in. Thank you. So going kind of now shifting a little bit, this is kind of just a fun couple questions. So on what actually matters. So question one, name who won the most popular in your high school. And I can't see it because I'm sharing my screen, but I hope you're all rolling your eyes because I really don't care who was most popular. What actually matters to me, and I hope to all of you, is who supported you through a tough time? Because I can, I really like, 
A, didn't care who was most popular, being, you know, someone who was not popular. And I also have another phrase that I honestly say a lot of panels that I do is that um, if you peak in high school, then like it's game over. If, if it, like his life is way beyond high school, that was my little comfort to all the, for the mean popular kids in school. But honestly, though, and seriously, um, you know, it really is about that perspective shift and um, certainly for me, I can, you know, even just employment based, you know, Mary Jane Biaz, Aaron Zanovich, Diane Mariani, I years and years later still remember all the support they gave me, all their kindness, all their warmth, all their empathy, all their curiosity. Um, and so again, and just bringing it back to, to making that impact, moving young people forward. Um, and, you know, including this quote from Maya Angelou, you know, really people, you know, will always remember how you made them feel. And so bringing it back to all of you, can you be that person that is remembered uh, for making a difference? And I think that's so powerful because I think we're all, you know, can be really busy in our day-to-day -day lives. And I know I'm certainly guilty of, you know, being distracted at times and feeling like, well, I'm too busy for that. But I, I think it's so helpful to remember is bringing it back to the why, right? Why are, if you're a professional in this field, why are we doing this work? If you're a parent, you know, why am I making these decisions, you know, for my child? If you are a young adult, you know, then, you know, could you even think about it like, you know, being grateful and having that gratitude for those who are in your corner, um, so it's just kind of, again, a, a nice little perspective shift. So you'll kind of notice some themes I was talking about. So creating a culture of wellness, um, this really applies to like really every area of life, I feel like, but I call it my three Ps, right? People, policies, programs. So uh, I think people is the easiest one to kind of get through. You know, again, it seems like simple, but you know, are you kind? Can you see beyond how someone is now, as I mentioned about my story? Um, can, you, can you empathize and offer support? Um, can you connect a young adult to someone who might be able to support them? You know, if, and, and, that's, and that's part of what I'm huge on too, is you know, we all can only do so much. And I'm a huge advocate of don't burn yourself out. We are probably all in this field guilty of taking on too much. So it's, it's being able to do that warm handoff. And um, again, thinking long-term, big picture, um, can you respond without judgment? And all of those things, as I said, really do take some awareness, um, some mindfulness. Um, and I'm just a huge fan of, I think when you can do all that, like you're just going to be naturally happier. That's how I see it. Um, and so again, that's um, really kind of easy to kind of break down amongst professionals, parents, families, young adults, but now kind of moving towards policies and programs. I'm kind of aiming, of course, more to if you're someone who um, is an administrator, if you have kind of decision-making power for an agency, et cetera. And I'm sorry, you're probably hearing my cats. They were quiet up till now. I have two cats and they love chirping and chiming in when I'm presenting sometimes. Yes, hi, Rex, you're famous now. Um, so when I talk about policies, um, you know, do you have clear policies on mental health, quality of life? And the reason I'm including that is, you know, when I was struggling the most, it was always at places that did not have those policies, or maybe they were watered down by a lack of clear communication, um, or, you know, managers who weren't really the best champions for those policies, and it kind of got lost in the tracks through them. And then projects and programs. Um, can you start, support, enhance, or otherwise help a project or program that will impact young adults? And, you know, and talking again to friends, colleagues, reflecting on my own life, you know, again, it's, it's those agencies and people and just moments that um, they kind of really all line up where when it all comes together, the three Ps, that's when you'll see the most growth um, and I know that's kind of throwing a lot at you, but I think um, it's just something to consider that, you know, doing what you can, you know, with, with what you have. So it's kind of stepping up to the plate and whatever, whatever gifts you have, they can share with others. So kind of getting to a nuts and bolts. This is um, a framework that I really love. This is called Heart's Ladder. And I love talking about this because um, talking about young adult voice and how do you move systems forward? How can you be 
um, you know, creating positive change. Um, it really is a great kind of like visual on where are we right now? And so kind of talking about agencies first, professionals, um, the breakdown really is obviously the goal is to go up the ladder and whatever you're doing, get as close to the top as you can. So no one wants manipulation, decoration, tokenism. Um, you know, I always say four and five are not always bad, but aim for the green, you know, adult initiated, share with young adults, young adult led, young adult and adults being equal partners. And you'll kind of notice the themes, right? All, all of the top three have that theme of respect, autonomy, um, sharing space, sharing power. So it's just something that I like to always share in most presentations that um, it, it honestly is a great re reflection tool. Like um, I've even shared and, and recommended some agencies in your supervision, because you can Google this. If you Google Hearts Ladder, it can really help break it down too with more time than I have today. But um, you know, it really can be great for supervision. Hey, you know, how are we doing? You know, how are things going? Where do you think we are on the ladder? So it really is having that honest conversation with yourself, with your colleagues, if you're coming at it from the family lens, even just with your, you know, with your own transition and as a family unit, you know, how are we doing? How are, are we setting the stage for my child to have, a uh, young adult to have choices? Am I offering room to grow? Um, I have another phrase I love called falling forward because I've personally grown the most through mistakes and um, those can be really uncomfortable, but I think it's through those mistakes and having those learning moments that a lot of positive change can happen. So I think as, you know, as we're talking about wellness and change and how do you set the stage for successful employment, it really is helpful. And even if you're a young adult, I would recommend, you know, young adults are very intuitive, you know, um, if you're applying to jobs, you know, you can get a sense of company culture. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. But I think this can be just a great, almost like first step if you're feeling a little like, you know, a little stuck, maybe start here. And then I always want to mention um, the eight dimensions of wellness. This is from SAMHSA, which is a Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration. And what I love about the eight dimensions of wellness is it really is another great kind of start here framework that what is a good life? What does wellness look like? What does positive mental health look like? And certainly for me, uh, I definitely remember when I was not doing so well, I was missing those key pieces. So um, I think there can sometimes be um, a little misconception that mental health is only, you know, emotional, but there's often, you know, in, in, in the people who are happiest and, you know, in, with my life now, it's thinking holistically, right, the puzzle pieces. And so um, certainly in my, in my life, it, it was, um, it's when that all came together. And I think, um, you know, when you're talking about wellness, you know, I, I think it might be helpful to think about it a piece at a time, like, because personal change and growth, um, of course, it can feel overwhelming. And but when you break it down into those baby steps, so um, hypothetically, you know, if you're an adult, if you're family, if you're working with someone, I wouldn't recommend, hey, let's tackle all these categories at once. You know, that's, you know, creating that partnership and what you want to work on. How do you, where would you rate your life? So I think it's, you know, using this as a tool to say, um, what would a 10 out of 10 look like for, you know, your emotional health? Uh, what would you need to do to get there? How can I support you to get there? So it's having that conversation, um, but breaking it down and again, in, into those actionable steps. And um, just at the bottom here um, in the bullets, again, if you're an agency, can you move forward policies or programs that can really help encourage this? I think um, in most of the jobs that I've held, this was not really a priority. And, um, and it was just this, this almost this inhuman focus on just show up and do your work and we don't care about you. And of course, like how happy are you going to be with that? So I think there's a lot of ways you can use the eight dimensions of wellness. So talking about common pitfalls in employment, um, you know, breaking down a couple of categories, 
Um, everything <laughs> that I'm listing here, I've been through. So I, I'm never going to talk about something I personally probably didn't go through in, in a, from a personal capacity. So, um, you know, this really applies, again, for young adults. If you're supporting a young adult, just keep these things in mind. Um, some pitfalls on in searching lens, uh, being open to opportunity. Um, and I know there's that common phrase, it's who you know, which in some respects is true. So I think it's, um, can you find ways to make networking comfortable and fun and just putting yourself out there? I think for me, I had some personal blocks on like, was I good enough? How, how do I how do I know what I'm good at? And we'll talk more about self care and some more stuff in a couple of slides. But I think while I'm mentioning it here, it really is getting to that place of knowing your value. And that's just huge, right? So much of work is knowing your value and giving, you know, a company your value and knowing you're helping people. Um, another pitfall can be not keeping your eyes open to next steps. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, for young adults out there, um, you know, are you feeling stuck? You know, I think it, it's pretty normal to change your jobs. I mean, I looked at my resume, right? And I've changed my jobs at least seven or eight times over the course of my career so far. So it's getting to that, you know, places. What I've seen out there is a lot of young adults can almost feel like they're not loyal if they change jobs or maybe feeling scared. Like I remember when I first left one of my first jobs and I was so nervous about having that conversation. I think I wrote, I am chuckling like now, I think I wrote just like a quick like scribble letter and like I'm quitting, here's my like notice. And I like ran to it in like my manager's office when I knew he wasn't there. So um, it's it's just getting again to that place of um, of being comfortable with who you are and um, and when I, and going to the next point, you know, honoring who you are and what are your interests. I think this could be a whole separate presentation, right? But I think in thinking of employment. Um, with globalization and you know virtual there can be so many opportunities that weren't there so i think it's um like for example my interests i love creative i love art i love advocacy i've always been in roles that were more service-based um i also worked in the cosmetic industry i went to aesthetic school worked at sephora did makeup artistry so i took those interests i started somewhere you know, my very first job was at, you know, a craft store Then I worked as a companion homemaker. I just took time to jump in. I needed to work. It was keeping myself busy because um, when I was a teenager with my depression, I knew by not trying something, I was going to be stagnant, right? But it's keeping in mind your first job or a job you have now. It may not be what you want to do, um, but it's keeping your, you know, your eyes out and, and go, going for what your interest is. I think, um, you know, when we're talking about people who can be, you know, we all may know someone who like hates their job, right? And they're like, I'm just in it for the retirement, honey, or I'm in it for the pension. Not that pensions are common, but we all, it's the running gag of like the people who have, who are soulless, who have no life and they're waiting to retire. And, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of sad, honestly. So I'm just a huge advocate of um, doing what you love. And it may be a side hobby, it may be a side gig, you know, but but it's finding a way to to give back and just honoring who you are. And so I say that my next point is, is your resume up to date and compelling? Um, and it's, I love resume writing. I may one day like open my own resume business and <laughs> for that, because I just love helping others find their strengths. And that to me is what the heart of a resume is, is, you know, helping young adults um, not just like list your jobs, but can, can, you know, if you're in a supportive role, can you help a young adult find ways to highlight their strengths to, to really put that on paper? Like, wow, I did this. I own this. I know I'm great at it. I brought value to X, Y, Z, wherever. Um, so I mentioned that, you know, if, you know, whether you need a professional update it, um, just, I am a huge advocate for making sure, even in the virtual world, even with networking, keep that resume up to date. So now going forward to pitfalls and job interviews, and this is pretty obvious dress for success. This is not time for, you know, sweatpants in a job interview. As much as I would love to, to wear sweatpants all day, certain days, um, goes without saying, you know, dress for success, but we all 
I'm surprised though. I hear stories, but I think it's providing that education. And it's not about, again, brand labels. It's not about any of that. It's just um, having that self-respect and just saying, you know, dressing for the job you want. Um, another pitfall I've seen, and you could even say it's a strength too, right? Is having those stories and examples drawing from your life. So like, like again, my first couple interviews, um, was a learning experience. I really didn't have those prepared. So it's, it's, and I don't expect, you know, for someone who's starting out to have a, like a bunch of experiences or examples, but I think it's, you know, do you have examples you can draw from volunteering from, you know, really being of service to others? So I talked, I talked about knowing your value already. So disclosure, I want to, um, make a special note. So, in my own story with my, you know, having my mental health challenges, I did not disclose that. I know there are certain disabilities that you disclose when you walk in the room. I, I, I'm acknowledging that. So we included a link on the bottom of this slide here. There is a great disclosure guide and Dawn's gonna have that in the resources sent out as well. Um, but I think so just definitely knowing your rights. If you're a young adult, please know that you can shut that down. You know, if, if things are, you know, if they're breaking that. And if you're someone in a supportive role, um, you know, it could look like maybe helping a young adult prepare for your interview and just knowing that up front. So pitfalls on the job, um, not giving your job enough time. And this one was huge for me. And the heart of what I mean by that is, and Don, we are talking about that too, um, in planning for this session is there's almost that theme of letting fear run your life. Like for me, in my first couple jobs, I uh, was still working through uh, my anxiety. It, it was really hard to push myself to go. I, I'm not gonna lie. So I, I think it's um, finding a way and uh, I'm being mindful of time, but um, you know, and whatever talking about those wellness practices, um, you know, not letting fear, you know, really, really be a, a common theme. Um, I say chunking your mindset and that goes into not letting fear run your life, right? So, um, you know, incorporating those wellness practices. Uh, a pitfall in the job too is staying stuck. I mentioned earlier, um, I know people who hate their job, feel stuck, but don't push themselves to make the change, right? So, um, that's a whole other presentation on creating and maintaining change too. But, um, you know, in just in terms of awareness for today with our time we have left, just being aware, um, you know, I'm not putting down if someone loves where they're working and they want to be there long term, but we all can kind of tell, right, when someone may just seem stuck. So having that honest conversation of where do you see yourself in a year, five years, et cetera, and kind of going from there. But then, you know, the, my last point, being okay if your job isn't okay, leaving your job on a great note. And, you know, I, I say that, that um, I've actually left jobs and came back. So the classic phrase of don't burn bridges because you may need them, you know, one day. So it's really about, again, recognizing you as an employee still have power. You can be professional, putting, putting in your two weeks, um, is really like the best practice. Hey, Michael, like it's Dawn. I'm sorry. I just wanted to give you a time check. It is 1236. Perfect. We're, we have a couple more to go. Then we'll have time for questions. Great. Thanks, Dawn. So I know that slide was a ton of information. So this one's a little less intense, but, um, you know, really, um, again, talking about themes, really breaking down what's helpful and not helpful. So, really quickly being helpful doing with not helpful doing for so again breaking that down for me my parents were great about you know okay michael you want to apply for a job you know you get that started and whatever support you need you can have that versus if you're someone who's applying to jobs for someone where's the personal growth where's the learning uh, where's their own comfort level where's their identity as someone who's capable, right? That is like, if you could take away one thing is um, helping young adults who may have disabilities to feel capable because certainly um, that was such a huge barrier 
um, for, for, for my own self-esteem. And I think in talking about building self-esteem, it really is honestly mucking through some of those murky challenges or uncomfortable moments, right? So I think I'm putting that first because uh, I just think it's beyond valuable to always have the mindset of doing with and not doing for. So um, having the element of curiosity, as I've mentioned, versus telling a young adult what to do next. I don't have to explain that one. Um, but talking about setting the stage for them is super helpful um, versus, um, you know, just steamrolling young adults and again, and doing everything for them. Uh, more helpful things being strength based, praising, asking if they'd like your support and making a wellness plan. Again, a huge on baby steps, discussing the why on tasks. And I want to talk about for a second the why, because I think for it's not talked about enough. I think the why is so important um, in any decision making um, at work. Um, I always love to bring about the why. So for example, let's just say you're a manager and you control who gets promoted, right? So say you have a young adult working with you and they did not get picked. They're super excited. They want this new promotion, but they didn't get it. So something to be helpful is um, instead of just saying you didn't get it or keeping it really impersonal, I think it's perfectly fine to bring that why, you know, maybe um, it, ha it had a different requirement, maybe, you know, I, I can't, you know, I can't say that for an agency, but I think it's always the why to me really showcases respect because historically young adults and especially young adults with disabilities have had either the whys done for them or have not been clearly communicated, you know, to them. And then just really quickly, um, again, things that are not helpful, being fear limita limitation based and not making time for an open door policy. So talking about practical skills and moving forward, just really quickly, um, I'm huge on communication, learning on the job versus at home language. Um, you know, we all know there are certain things you can say, you know, at home versus on the job. I've had to learn the hard way. I, the way I coped through stress was making jokes. Some of those jokes were a little too intense for the nine to five. So had a talking to once or twice on that. Um, so being aware of that, the XYZ method, this may not always work in a work environment, but it's worth noting. I think for me, it's, I wanted to bring that to you all. The XYZ method is when you do X, um, I feel Y, so please do Z. So it's a great way to kind of acknowledging, you know, your own feelings, um, you know, letting them know where you stand on certain things and asking for a different preference. So um, I wanted to share that. And then learning and deal with criticism and feedback. This one's huge. I remember I used to melt in a puddle of near tears whenever I got feedback just because that was such a huge button or a trigger for me. So, um, and again, when I, when I talked about having those murky, uncomfortable experiences, there's going to be feedback, there's going to be criticism. So it's not if it happens, it's when it happens. And so um, in efforts of time, you know, I just think um, preparing for that and hopefully that is brought to in a constructive way. But I think that's a huge, a huge component of being successful on the job and having that skill of graciously, if it's, if it's, you know, not meant and mean spirited, graciously saying, okay, thank you. And what can I do to move forward, et cetera. Um, wellness Michael, practices. Yep. I'm sorry, it's Dawn again. We have a question. Yep. How important is recognizing social interactions in the workplace relative to the workplace culture? And let me just um, specify, they say, I have an individual that they work with who gossips about management at work and does not recognize the impact of their relationship with management, does not understand that colleagues might share this with the manager, how would you suggest helping to develop that type of workplace awareness? Oh, this is a great question. So I would say to that, I would talk with that young person and say, um, you know, in some type of way, what, you know, what are you getting from that? Like, what is your reasoning to gossip? Again, as I shared, I had to learn, like, you know, I, I can't guess, you know, for me, I think part of, you know, whether it was joking, I mean, I've gossiped a little bit, but I think for me, that was maybe something I wanted to fit in, 
that might be what it is, but I think so. Usually we all do something because we're getting something from it. So I think it's it's figuring out, you know, what are you getting from it? Can you get that in, in a more productive way? Because certainly you want to maintain um, a great professional relationship with management at work. And I hope that's helpful. She says I that she loves that you said, what are you getting from that? That's 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 great. Um, wanting to fit in is precisely what she is suspecting of this person. Yeah, and I, I think it is easy. And I think it's an easy trap to fall into because, oh well, yeah, we know we can all have that gripe, water cooler, this and that. But I think it comes to, um, usually comes back to bite you. So um, certainly, you know, you know, keep it at home for sure. You, you can always maybe plan, you know, can you have a friend or a family member? Hey, do you want to privately vent to me in a way that can't get back, you know, not that venting forever, you know, I'm, you know, moving forward from venting, but finding a way to have a win-win on that. Right. And we do know that with certain disabilities, they some struggle, may struggle with um, those social cues and um, socializing, so. Okay, thank you. No problem. And so kind of, um, I promise we're almost done <laughs> so like we can get the questions to uh, wellness practices. So I talked about, um, I struggled with self-esteem and just walk through life really not feeling confident or, you know, um, really in, in, a, in a lower state. So a couple of things in bringing to mind like nuts and bolts is I would encourage young adults and if anyone in a supportive role, having a conversation of what do you do well? And that may be like, well, I don't know what I do well, but it's again, drawing it out from them, working with them, you know, and it can be like beyond work. What I mean by that is I know, like for me, I know I'm a great cook. I know I'm a great artist. I know I'm kind. I know I'm funny. I know I, you know, care about others, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, it's listing it out because it's breaking the pattern of, having all that negativity, as I talked about, that insidious, silent, like, are you capable? Can you do this? All that doubt and fear and this spiral, right, of, you know, maybe what a lot of young adults with disabilities may have gone through. So it's finding a way to, you know, break that habit of, um, you know, if, if that's helpful. Um, the kindness box, kind of along a similar pattern, um, it's getting to that place of, now what you do well is for you, right? Um, but kindness box, if you have friends, family, have them write things they like about you that they know you're good at. It's building, again, breaking that, that pattern of, um, of any negativity. And then EAP services. Uh, I'm mentioning this because I didn't always know this. And I think, you know, therapy can cost money, obviously. And so many companies have EAP services that are confidential. They're free. Most employers hopefully have them. Um, I haven't personally used it. I know a few people who have. So I think it's worth mentioning that, you know, if you're working with someone who um, might need more support than what you can offer, um, check into EAP services. And then I actually included a link at the bottom dealing with criticism. I thought that was a great link to really break down more than I can for today's session on different types of criticism and how to move forward and, re and really treat it as uh, I don't want to say a gift because no one likes criticism, but treat it as a learning moment that maybe years down the road, you can be grateful you maybe got that feedback. So um, someone is asking, what does EAP actually stand for? Yes. And I'm sorry, my, I'm having a moment here. It's, um, <laughs> I'll have to Google it in a second. It's like employee, um, oh gosh, no, I, I feel terrible. It's, it's basically... Um, I'm going to Google it right now. It'll take me a second. I was going to say, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. And you know, when you're like presenting or like talking, like the bigger the meeting, the more your brain can like act Employee up. Assistance program. Dawn, somebody said it answered it. Yeah, somebody. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see it there. Yep. Employee assistance. Thank program. you. Yep. It was. I, thank you for that. Yes. My, our friends Google helped us. So definitely look into that. And so kind of wrapping up. Um, I do have to give a little plug for some resources we made here at CPAC as part of our youth advisory board. Um, there's some, you'll see at the bottom, there's a link to our students and young adult page. Um, there's everything from self-care plans, um, what's useful versus not useful. We made these because I wish I had these. These are great at spending time 
you know, on your own with a young adult, you know, um, to really map out where, where am I, where do I want to be, what does my life look like, um, and I think, you know, there's so many young adults who um, I don't think ever take the time to kind of have that quiet moment and sit and like, who am I, who am I being, who do I have to be to move forward, so it's, you know, it's, it's again, that roadmap to, to change and moving forward. So I definitely want to make you all aware of these resources. And so I just want to thank you. I know I've been talking at a lightning speed to keep us in time, but I'm happy to answer any questions or comments as we so have. We do have some time. questions. Um, before we go ahead with the questions, I just, I'm going to put up a poll. Um, if you don't mind um, just answering that poll, it helps us rather than send you an evaluation afterwards. We'll just get your thoughts now. And you could certainly put in any um, comments you have with regard to this uh, workshop in the, in the chat box as well. So I'm just going to post this and then I have some. Um, so, okay, I just, I just launched the poll and then I will now go through the questions. Um, and i Jacob has his hand up. He'd like to say something, but let me just get through some of the questions first. Okay. Oh, I'm, I went too far up. Sorry about that. What are your thoughts on mental health employment apps? And are there any you would recommend? <laughs> um, I feel like we have, again, talking about the resources at CPAC, uh, I know we have some there, but generally I think apps are awesome. I think young adults were so in touch with technology. Um, my one caveat to that is like, this is kind of separate, but kind of similar is um, not letting technology like run your life. And I, I love video games. I'm a huge TV person. I, I could be in a front of a screen all day long. I would just say use apps the best way for you. Um, you know, there's one, okay, my brain's having a moment here. It's um, like a mindfulness app. You know, there's ones you can listen to music to fall asleep. I'm a huge sensory guy. I listen to like meditation tracks to fall asleep at night. Um, some people are huge on affirmations and having an app to like listen to those. So I think it's using technology without um, getting sucked into what I call the technology vortex where, you know, it's, it's can be an addiction where you're living life in your technology um, and not always being fully present, if that makes sense. And then Jacob, if you want to unmute yourself, um, Jacob is our youth coordinator at um, the Federation for Children with Special Needs in Massachusetts. And um, go ahead, Jacob, if you wanted to mention something. Um, there are three things. And uh, Mike, I just want to say that uh, in 10 years of working, I've never told anyone that I have borderline personality disorder. And I've never seen anyone openly discuss um, their issues. So I want to say thank you for that. Um, and there's three things uh, that I wanted to mention. One is in my first career, which was in uh, the entertainment events running um, I found that the culture surrounding it, it was very, very difficult to avoid things that were more dangerous for someone like me than other people. And what I learned from that um, was uh, if you have a, a young adult who might be or a transition age person that might be gearing towards something that could be harmful, you can remind them that they don't have to do everything they love for money. And that in the world of employment, if you do things passionately whether you do them independently or as a part of an organization, uh, it will matter. I have extensive experience with things that I did myself, which later helped me a lot more than I expected. That was not my intention, but they were helpful. Uh, the second is, um, as an organization, it can be really helpful if you create a space where someone can say, hey, would you mind if I took 45 minutes during my lunch break once a week scheduled where I will not be able to answer emails so that they might be able to fit therapy into their schedule. A lot of young adults assume that they'll be okay and that they can get through things. And a lot of other young adults uh, don't necessarily love the idea of sticking to a plan that was made a year ago for them to continue therapy, they might be doing better. Um, but the nature of a lot of these emotional disorders, especially is that they are sporadic, um, bipolar, borderline types of depression, types of anxiety might go away entirely for six months, eight months, but 
something may trigger them. And uh, if they are not in a space where they've been adequately taking care of themselves, um, it, it can really impact uh, their life in and out of work. Uh, so that's another thing. And then the third thing is um, just there's there's a lot of talk that needs to be had uh, as a society basically about the idea of failure. Michael mentioned changing jobs a lot. I've changed jobs a lot. And um, encouraging young adults to take uh, the perspective that probably Michael has gotten now, I've gotten in that there is no failure so long as you've taken something from it. Um, can be incredibly helpful in, in helping motivate someone to make a decision that they may know they have to make, but still have trepidations as they see that it will have been a waste of time when in reality, at the very least, they know not to do that again. So I just wanted to tack on those three things and uh, shout or thank you to Connecticut. Thank you. To, it's I've never seen anyone talk about mental health from the first person before. And I think, you know, more people could that don't. So, Mike, you uh, you're a rock star. Yeah. Thank you, Jacob. Thank and before you. I want to, before I forget, I want to address. So thank you for sharing more about your story too, Jacob. And um, you're right. Failure to me is like a huge theme. Like give one more example and I'll open it up is like, even just in speaking, like my first, this was like five years ago on my first grant, I was hired. Right. I had never spoken before. I'm like, you know, I was asked to give like a quick opening, like remark at like a conference we're holding. I froze on you know at the podium i felt so much shame um no one you know, was disrespectful but i think it's you know it was that moment of like i what i felt like a, a in some respects a failure like can i do this it was having that sitting with that moment of like you know that resolve of can i push past this again and try it because i was so sick and tired of like it got to that moment with the internal like oh my god can i like you know i was sick of being in the shadow or like not living up to what i you know wanted to be so um i, I even in college like a couple more times had to present and i'm like oh my god here we go again can they just let me not present thank you and like my throat clogged up i had to get water i had to walk out halfway um so just putting putting that like opening up to the failure and releasing that stigma from that so thank you jacob for your comments so a lot of um um accolades here thank you you're wonderful both uh, jacob your your um sharing was also great thank you so much um so you will receive um, after this, uh, within a couple of days, the copy of the recording, along with some resource documents and the resources that Michael mentioned on the Connecticut um, Parrot Advocacy um, Center website, I've included those as well. So I really appreciate Michael. Thank you as always. Um, we've been working with Michael for a long time. And so we're very happy and we really appreciate you sharing with us today. Thank you. So it's my pleasure. Keep, everyone else, keep your eyes open to future webinars and thank you for joining us and have a great rest of the day. Great. Thanks everyone.